which hopefully I said that without slurring it too much, <laughs> with the Central West Local Land Services. And she's based in Grenfell. She's going to go over tonight some of the funding that's coming up and why it's important to protect some of these remnants that are in our neck of the woods. And then we're going to hear from Dan Clark. Dan's a botanical consultant with Arcane Ecologica. And he's going to tell us some of the cool species that you generally find in these little remnants so that you can go out after this webinar and have a look in your own backyard and see if you've got any of this stuff on your own properties. So without further ado, thank you, Caitlin from Dubbo and Tessa from Dripstone and Kira from Ningen and everybody else. And I'll hand over to Beck to get us started. Thanks very much, Danielle. Okay. Oh. So hi everyone. So this evening I'll I'll be presenting um, a short introduction on the Threatened Ecological Communities on Farms project. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm recording the webinar from the lands of the Wiradjuri people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you will join us from this evening and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal people and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. So just a little bit of webinar etiquette before we go too much further. Um, questions about what you've learnt in the presentations are encouraged this evening. So please place questions in the chat during this webinar. We'll have 10 minutes to go through a section, a selection of your um, questions following Dan's presentation. Uh, you're welcome to react during the webinar. So likes, applause, and all of those emojis are welcome. From now until question time, I'd like to ask uh, for you all to ex accept the, our presenters to mute your microphones, please, and slide your video feed to the off position, just in case anyone's having trouble with their internet. Okay, so the Threatened Ecological Communities on Farms project is funded by the Australian Government's National Heritage Trust and is being delivered by the Central West Local Land Services. The aim of the project is to support farmers and public land managers to implement management practices that will improve the condition of the box gum grassy woodlands and grey box grassy woodlands, plus provide production benefits. So in the Central West local land services region, native vegetation has been subject to several extensive clearing events following settlement in the 1830s. In this region, the ecological communities of box gum grassy woodland and grey box grassy woodland are listed nationally as endangered. Respectively, only 5% and 10% of their pre-settlement extent now remain as remnant patches across the region. Implementing um, a few key management practices is the best way to help protect, restore and extend our threatened ecological communities. The project will include an annual uh, invite to landholders in target areas with either or both of the box, the box gum grassy woodland or grey box grassy woodland to express an interest in funding. The the grants will provide uh, assistance for a variety of management practices, including weed control to reduce competition for native species, um, fencing to protect remnants from the impact of livestock and to reduce grazing pressure by pest animals and native wildlife. Controlling pests, um, including particularly pigs, rabbits, cats and foxes. Supplementary planting to improve diversity of existing remnants or improve the connectivity between remnant woodland patches. So looking after habitat by retaining and installing homes for wildlife also. So this might include uh, leaving fallen logs, rocks and dead standing trees within the remnant patches and in doing so providing shelter and places to hide for native animals. Alternatively, uh, reintroducing habitat features by installing nest boxes or augmented, augmenting tree hollows um, in existing trees. So the project's first year of landholder incentives, 24-25, will focus on farms between Wellington and Dubbo. 
Landholder grants will be rolled out in other target areas um, until, until 2027-2028, which is the project's fifth and final year. Um, so aside from managing um, grazing pressure, weed and pest animal control, revegetation of habitat and encouraging habitat for wildlife, there are several other activities that will be delivered as part of the project. So these include the development of skills and knowledge um, of our landholders, community members and stakeholders through engagement and training activities, awareness raising about threatened ecological communities through the provision of educational resources, the creation of short films and visibility on social and mainstream media. Demonstration um, of the importance of cool burns through cultural burning activities in years three and five will also happen. Extensive flora, flora surveys uh, to monitor change following implementation of the key management practices. And last, but by no means least, continuation of the annual monitoring of 33 floral survey plots set up in 2010 at our original population locations of the small purple pea. So the long-term monitoring of the endangered small purple pea which was once found throughout central New South Wales and parts of Victoria is important in determining if the density of the population is declining, stable or slowly increasing and what environmental or biological factors may be preventing its recovery. Now, here's just a few links for you to help find out more. And now I'd like to uh, pass you over to Dan Clark for his presentation on the importance of our threatened ecological communities and their amazing floral gems. So thank you, Dan. And I'll, I'll dive straight in because I am worried about running out of time. That, that's a bad way for a presenter to start, but we'll see how we go. But I'm really glad to be with you tonight. Um, I'm on Darwell land tonight in the Sydney area. So I'll pay my respects as well to the um, the eldest past and present on Darwell country in um, Sutherland Shire in Sydney. Um, yeah, diving straight in here, I just had this slide from another presentation, just in case you are not completely familiar, and I just wanted to throw it in in case very quickly. You might have been familiar with the Threatened Species Conservation Act 1995. It took that long for us to have something where threatened entities could be listed and protected and I guess recognised. But just if you weren't aware, those that act has now gone along with that nightmare native vegetation act that farmers used to wrestle with and we've now got a biodiversity conservation act but that pretty much functions the same way as what we call the tsc act at the new south wales level and we've also got an amended local land services act running alongside which i'm sure beck and danielle and stephen could tell you more about and are probably working within the constraints of i do all my work pretty much within the bc act but at the Commonwealth level, and I understand this is a Commonwealth funded project, um, you've got the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which will also list threatened entities and pretty much or almost mirror the Biodiversity Conservation Act. So they don't always completely mirror each other, but by and large, if you've got a threatened species listed in New South Wales, it will more than likely be listed at the Commonwealth level. So just if you were on holidays in 2016 and you haven't caught up and we've had COVID and all that sort of thing, they're the main acts we're running with now um, at New South Wales and then at the Commonwealth level. So you're probably familiar that, that these acts have the power to list uh, threatened flora, fauna and fungi. Now, I like this new little paradigm here We've always talked about flora and fauna, but we're now told it should have been three Fs and not two. Uh, we've now got fungi thrown in that are in their own group. And there is one example, at least in Sydney, where pretty much a colony of mushrooms growing in bushlands is now listed as a threatened uh, ecological community, which is quite interesting. And we might see more of that as we go forward. But uh, we have species, uh, whether animal, plant, uh, populations as well as ecological communities and that's what we're focusing on tonight just note that they're all recognized as being threatened 
and then they can be categorised as vulnerable, endangered or critically endangered. I've just been to a lot of, um, I guess, environmental meetings and a bit of protest where a lot of these terms get interchanged and get confused, but they're all threatened with extinction. And then they're just given one of these three categories. If we go beyond critically endangered, we're in the realms of presumed extinct and none of us really want to go there with anything we've got. So uh, Beck mentioned this one, uh, the Swainsona rector. This is a threatened plant in your part of the world. Um, the small purple pea, it's got the category of endangered both at the state and the Commonwealth level. Sometimes those categories can differ, but you know it can be vulnerable at one and endangered at the other. But again, I think they're trying to be a bit more consistent with each other, and this is endangered. Beautiful plant. We saw this last week. Uh, Stephen took me to see this one uh, as part of the workshop. But our focus tonight is these threatened ecological communities. And just in case you're not familiar, it's where we are taking the whole vegetation community as a whole, a unique assemblage of species that occur together in a certain part of the world and are now, uh, yeah, like Beck said, being cleared to a lot of the time to within an inch of their life sort of thing. So we're taking in the canopy, the shrub layer, which in this photo is more or less absent, and the ground layer as well. Um, and one of the ones we're focusing on has this, this mouthful of a name, which is called white box, yellow box, Blakely's red gum, grassy woodland and derived native grasslands. That's the first TEC. This would be the most prominent TEC on the tablelands and I'd say the, you know, part of the Western Slopes. Uh, it's sort of the forerunner, one of the flagship TECs that is pretty much the well-known. Um, just in case you're wondering, uh, you know, the government isn't picking on your part of the world. Uh, you know, this all started in the Sydney area and it's radiated out from there. It's getting to the point now in Sydney, if, if you walk into any patch of bushland, it's pretty much going to be a TEC. So we've got about 30 TECs in Sydney and it's radiated out into all of New South Wales and now they're recognised everywhere. I think we're over about, we're over now 100 threatened ecological communities in New South Wales, I believe. Um, this one is now critically endangered. The Commonwealth and the state have pushed it to that brink. So that's a bit of a red light for um, everybody. Uh, that's It's on the fertile country. It's a, it's normally in the valleys and on the creek lines. It's It's been on the fertile farmlands and we can understand it's um, it's been on the productive land. It's not really up the rocky slopes and the ridges. And um, it's, it's very common on the tablelands parts of New South Wales, but I, I'd say it, it sort of gets into the more the eastern parts of the western slopes, if that makes sense. So we're treating the whole community as a whole, trees, mid-storey, ground layer. We think about the habitat that use it, the microbes in the soil. It, it involves the soil underneath as well. Um, and if we're going to quantify it, we'll measure it in square metres or hectares. It's, it's a whole vegetation community. I just threw in um, some typical species that you can find in the white box, uh, yellow box community. And I want to show some of these in that order. There are three eucalypts that they're referring to, and that's Eucalyptus albans, Meliodora and Blakelii. And generally, you've got to have those, those um, plants making up the community. Um, just some mid-storey species or might be called the shrub layer. Um, we can have a lot of wattles like dilbata. We can have uh, currajong, chitin. You can put a lot in there, but these are just some typical ones that we find. And in the ground layer, you can have a whole range of things. Grasses, as it's called a grassy woodland, um, and a lot of herbs and forbs as well. There's a hell of a lot of diversity in the ground layer. And in most vegetation communities, 90% of the diversity will be in the ground layer. Just note it's got a clause here. Uh, it says, and derive native grasslands. And in ecology, we'll call that DNG. Um, if the trees have been cleared and the shrub layer has been cleared and we're pretty much left with a bit of a paddock or grassland type environment, if a lot of that 
is made up of native grasslands and forbs, the community can still be recognised in a modified form as derived native grasslands. And that requires, in my line of work, ecological assessment and things like that. But you can have a modified form of the community and, and that's a derived native grassland where the ground layer is still pretty much there. Uh, this is the grey box, the second one, uh, grey box grassy woodlands, and it's still got that derived native grasslands clause in there or modification of southeastern Australia. That's endangered. I would say this one is more common into the western slopes and I guess the western part of the western slopes. This is around parks where this beautiful tree, eucalyptus microcarpa, kicks in. It's called a grey box. They're quite easy to identify most of the time. We saw a lot of them around parks uh, the other day. Um, just a little bit different to the three trees that dominate the grassy box woodlands, but I'll I'll go into those as well. But normally it's on the penny plain country. Uh, the ground layer can be similar, though there's a lot of western species kicking in, which you don't get on the tablelands. Um, but that's the second uh, TEC we're focusing on tonight. Just want to show you what's online, what's online that you can get. There's a whole heap of literature. I've put, I'm happy for this PowerPoint to be available. Um, there's some links there. You can download documents like this and have a really good read. You can even get a species list on the next page. And I'm just showing some of these tonight. This is a, the, the grassy box woodlands. Um, there's some really good info there that you can have a good read on. Uh, that's the grey box uh, microcarpa woodlands. Uh, we can still get eucalyptus meliodora, that's a yellow box, but normally you get a dominance of microcarpa. We get a bit more colitis pine than we would in the, the, the white box, yellow box country. And you can also get a tree called bimble box, which I think is a pretty easily identifiable eucalypt um, with its, its green rounded leaves. That's, that's called poplar box, uh, that one there. The ground layer, you just get in a few more Western species coming in and a bit of a different dominance. Um, but the ground layer between the two TECs, they share a lot of species. Uh, there's a lot of crossover. A lot of these ground layer species have massive ranges and there's just a lot of crossover and a lot of commonality. Uh, some of the mid story will be different, like Acacia denii, which is a bit more of a Western species, and Acacia decora. We saw those around Parks and Wellington very easily uh, last week. Um, still got Currajong and uh, some really common mid story species like that. But they're just a few of the, the common ones there. Um, just the importance of TECs. Uh, you know, a, a lot of typical things about keeping bushland on sites. We argue they're, they're unique assemblages of species that, that form the natural vegetation of the landscape. You know, these things have been here for thousands of years and, and we tend to knock them over really quickly. Uh, they're essential for habitat, for local wildlife. That includes vertebrates. It includes insects, which we're getting more and more worried about these days. Uh, microbes in the soil. Uh, all that sort of thing, all the fungi that live in the soil as well. Well, you know, well, ecologists will argue they're good for soil, soil stability, nutrient recycling, they're reducing water runoff, they're part of the water cycling and that sort of thing. Water's been pumped up through the trees, been evaporated off. Um, very important for holding soil moisture. Uh, we're worried about carbon these days. We, we, believe that vegetation sequesters carbon and when it gets uh, degraded or knocked over you just get carbon dioxide plumes being released and they'll provide shade for wildlife livestock they'll also you know reduce the heat sink event uh, or heat sink effect I should say on the ground and one of the things that government will look at and I think uh, Beck and Danielle and Stephen will, will sort of look at is how patches um, connect to each other for the purposes of regeneration and rehabilitation. And more and more, we're looking at the landscape in terms of connectivity and stepping stones of patches, uh, you know, between patches, allowing fauna to move between those patches. So look, I just took a random shot here from um, Easter Parks, and I, I didn't mean to pick on anyone's property or anything like that. It's just a random Google map shot. But 
I don't know what the land use is here, but we can see what we might call some pretty intact or what look to be intact patches of vegetation, even though we can see um, some fragmentation between. But if a person wanted to do some restoration here, for example, then that might be pretty appeasing for funding and things like that in order to enhance vegetation and, and form more connection between patches. If someone wanted to do some planting of trees, say along there, and it like, for example, if koalas were in this habitat, they could move from this patch and might be able to move more safely to this patch. So government are looking to, to do a lot of what we call wildlife corridors and connectivity rather than, say, plant a thousand trees here and try and get some funding for it. It'd be sort of more favourable to possibly do that here and relieve the fragmentation of these patches and just provide some more connectivity. And that's one thing that that government is sort of strongly looking at. Um, there's a lot of ecolo ecological research that goes into connectivity and stepping stones and and sort of the the processes of fragmentation. So I just got this off the web the other night. Um, it's it's in the northeast of New South Wales, but they've gone to efforts here to to put in I guess belts of trees to connect one patch to the other. Um, and it's a bit of an example of how. Uh, people are trying to connect patches up. Just these lines of trees where animals might move through, birds might move through, and koalas might move through, and, and other fauna as well. And it's just one important aspect. Um, when a patch sort of gets fragmented like this and it has a big edge ratio on the end, um, ecologists do detect a decrease in ecological function. You get less mammals coming in, you get less insects coming in, you get plant species dropping out, you get other plant species taking over. Um, it's subject to edge effects, you get more weed invasion and the ecological function of this patch will decrease over time. And sometimes it's really obvious as an ecologist when you walk into it, you just see a lack of diversity. So it's we're trying to sort of, I guess, stitch these two together um, and, and create more intact patches. So now I'm moving on to the floral gems and, and hope I can get through these. This is Eucalyptus albans, which is one of the trees of the grassy box woodland TEC, called the white box. Uh, box trees or box eucalypts normally have this finely tessellated bark in a bit of a jigsaw pattern. And when you go halfway up the tree, it'll go to smooth bark and you might get the odd ribbon or so hanging down in a lot of box trees. So finely tessellated, smooth up the top where the branches come out. Eucalyptus albans has these nice generous buds and they normally have a bit of a waxy hue on them. It's a very common tree on the tablelands and slopes of New South Wales. Nice big flowers and the leaves will have a bluey green look to them. Uh, the ones we saw at Mount Arthur last week, the leaves are pretty much blue. They've, they've just got a large hint of blue in them and, and they're up sort of that end of the spectrum. and if you're looking at a box eucalypt, they tend to have fruits like this, where they've just got a, a deeply inserted disc there. And the best way to describe them is, is a champagne glass, or, a, or a, I call them a wedding champagne glass. You know, probably doesn't need that on it. But if you think of a wedding champagne glass, um, these are a really good example. And they're on the large side for boxes, on the large side of the scale. This is yellow box the famous Eucalyptus meliodora, it would be the, I would say the most common tree if you take the tablelands and the Western slopes combined. It's probably, it, it'd be in the top three most numerous trees, even though a lot of its habitat has been cleared, but uh, they're a uh, favorite one with beekeepers. Their fruit is a bit more of a, or their, their gum nut, if you like, it's a bit more of a cup shape, not so much of a champagne glass, but you're getting the same sort of shape there. They flower very prolifically. Their leaves tend to be a bit narrower than the a white box. They tend to be a lot narrower, and sometimes they're a lot shorter with a, with a bit of an elliptic shape. Still bluey green, a bit more maybe green than those of Alvin's, but they do vary a bit, blue green to green. And again, the bark will go up to the lower branches there, and then it will go smooth for the rest of that. But if you look at a yellow box trunk, and we did see this last week, the bark will sort of S-bend up the tree. I'm exaggerating it a bit, but it will sinuate as it goes up the tree. You can see these sort of S-bends in the bark. 
and it's a bit of a good feature for Meliodora. It's not there all the time, but it's there a lot of the time. So look out for that. It's a it's a dominant one in grassy box woodland. It can be in the grey box woodland as well. It's got a big range. This is Eucalyptus microcarpa. It's got a trunk like Eucalyptus albans, but it's a lot darker. It's normally darker brown and not that sort of pale grey that we saw. A bit darker. And the thing about the leaves, which I haven't shown, but the leaves are green. They're a nice green colour most of the time. The same tone of green on both sides. They can be a little bit bluey green, but they're, they're down the green end of the spectrum. Buds like Meliodora, and they've sort of got fruit like Meliodora or the yellow box as well. But their microcarpa sort of means small fruit, so they'll be on the small side. And they're a lot smaller than Eucalyptus albans. Um, and I'm just ignoring all the intergrades here because that just gets complicated. But um, another typical box fruit, look for them. If you're around parks and that sort of area, uh, going west to Griffith and north as well from there, um, they're a really common tree, uh, even on the side of the road um, as you drive along. I just got asked to throw this one in, Eucalyptus conica, the fuzzy box. We saw these around parks uh, last week and I had to get more familiar with them. They're a bit of a vague one to me, but they've got more of a messy bark down the bottom, very fibrous and chunky. They've got a canopy like Eucalyptus albans and that's what we thought they were, but they were just looking a bit different. But it's a very common tree. Again, it's probably part of the grey box woodland TEC. And Danielle just mentioned micro bats, and I, I got asked to do a, a bit of a cross promotion here. You can get these guys um, getting under the bark of these trees. So I'll happily get under the bark and sit under there. So they're good habitat trees for that sort of thing. We have a lot of micro bat species in New South Wales. They um, are not usually insect eaters. We have some threatened species. We have some common ones and we have some threatened ones. And these are the only time I've helped an ecologist do some microbat trapping and I managed to get these photos. Um, they're tiny. Um, I mean, that thing sort of doesn't look that small, but then you look at his finger and you can see how sort of tiny it is. Um, these are trapped at night and then they're released um, the following night once they're identified. Um, this was around Gunnedah where we did a site and um, I think he caught about 50 microbats during the night. They they can whip over your head at dusk. Uh, sometimes you just think it's a moth going over your head, but a lot of the time it's these guys. They'll live in a tree hollow, they'll live under the bark and they can live under a concrete bridge uh, on a main road or a, or a minor road. If it's got little recesses under the concrete, um, sometimes there's holes under there and they can live in those. So we get worried about these guys as well. And just remember their relatives, the flying foxes. We get told by flying fox experts that they do most of the pollinating. So they will fly up to 100 kilometres every night pollinating eucalyptus trees. So they're, they're reported to be the main pollinator. So these guys will go for the insects, but the, the flying foxes will go for the, um, the eucalypts and the fruit. Um, tree hollows. In ecology now, we're very um, concerned about these hollow bearing trees. I only photographed these two yellow boxes on a farm in Goulburn a couple of weeks ago, but um, uh, you can, yeah, they're pretty decrepit and pretty isolated, but you can see the hollows that are in them. This one's full of hollows here. And if you take time to have a look, they're full of parrots. Uh, they can be, they can have possums in them. You can see a bird of prey using them or you can get bees, or you can probably get micro bats as well. So um, these take decades to form. Um, in a place like Sydney, we're just losing them all. And uh, then they're, they're a non-renewable resource because they take so long to form. So we're really worried about those too. When, a, when you know, a person who, who wants to do some environmental conservation, when they've got hollow bearing trees, we're really happy to see that. And we try and encourage them to keep them. and. Um, just keep the tree for as long as possible to keep those hollows in there. Uh, I'll move into the mid story. Um, this is Acacia decora. It's a very common one in the grey box woodland TEC as you get a bit further west. This will grow on the side of the road. We saw it easily last week. It wasn't flowering, unfortunately. It had just finished. But this is a beautiful wattle on the western slopes. Easily identifiable most of the time. Doesn't grow very tall. 
often it's on the side of the road at about a metre tall or, or two metres, and um, you, it's probably one you can get familiar with. So if you've got a lot of this on your property and a bit of eucalyptus microcarpa, well, you might have, you know, the grey box woodland TEC, even if it's in a modified form. Uh, this one is more from the grassy box woodland a bit further east. It sort of dropped out um, when I got to parks, but this is Acacia dill barda, the silver wattle. It's a beautiful one in the grassy box woodland, especially around Bathurst and Orange. Uh, flowers profusely. The leaves have a really blue, silvery hue to them. And further west at Parks and Wellington, there's a really similar species called Denii. That doesn't flower quite as prolifically, but it's still a nice and common one. The leaves are a bit more green and a bit more spaced out on Denii. And on Dilbata, they're nice silvery blue and a bit sort of, well, silvery green blue and a bit sort of compact. But two beautiful waddles, Dilbata and Denii, um, that uh, are part of these um, TECs. We saw this last week, a beautiful Swain Sona. This one isn't threatened, but it's a common one. But uh, this is a pea. These pea flowering plants are great for attracting insects. They're part of both TECs. And we saw one in full flower last week, and I'm so glad Beck uh, took a photo. Um, really common plant um, and just an example of a, of a, of a pea flower. That's, that's a big family related to the wattles, um, which the insects really go for. This is a hop bush, uh, a dodonea. Um, the flowers aren't that spectacular, but it's a female fruit that are really sort of showy. And these will uh, be eaten by a whole heap of parrots, uh, including rare ones as well, I'm told. The leaves are sticky. It's a very, very common shrub, like out in this part of the world. And, and it's even on the coast of New South Wales too. Um, but very common. It's a part of both TECs. It's a beautiful plant to have around just for the fruit. Uh, there, there, there's male and female plants, and this is a female plant that bears seed. But um, these beautiful papery capsules, they're a really important habitat resource. Just moving to the ground layer now and finishing off with about six or seven species to go. Look, I apologise for this. Some of these are my garden photos, but I'm sure you get the, the gist. Uh, this plant grows all over New South Wales with sort of a variety of forms. Uh, it'll be in your part of the world. It'll be in both of the TECs. Uh, the only difference is the foliage might be more blue. It might be a more um, blue type of uh, foliage um, and not so green. But have a look in your patches, see if you can see this one, especially in spring and summer. It does flower very readily. Um, you've got another daisy here called the Sticky Everlasting. This is Xerocrysum viscosum. We saw this in, in large numbers at the workshops last week, uh, whether it was Wellington or Parks. Uh, this guy was everywhere. Um, pretty easy to identify. It's a, it's a common plant. It's part of both of the TECs, and it, it's, it'd be very common even on the edges of um, farm paddocks where there's a bit of woodland. Um, just another pea scrambler. This one's got a lot smaller peas than the Swain Sona, but this is called a Glycine. A very useful plant for the ground layer that, um, oh, I guess, um, provides nitrogen in the soil. It's a very widespread species across New South Wales. Um, look for that one. It, it just means you've got a bit of native uh, herb forb sort of layer in the ground layer. It can climb up other shrubs. But it's pretty, it's pretty weak and pretty dainty. Um, but it's another pea um, scrambler. We, the grasses are very important in your two uh, TECs, obviously, the grassy box and the grey box. This is Themida kangaroo grass. It's just one of the easiest grasses to identify. Um, it's not the most prolific grass in these two TECs, but it is out there and you do get patches of it. And with these sort of kangaroo-like, um, poor-like, you know, fl uh, florets, I guess. The, the seeds are inside with these long black horns coming out when it's in seeding time. And um, it's just an easy grass to identify and it's very ecologically important for a lot of communities as well. It will be there in the TECs in patches. It's, it's I just find it's not one of the strongest grasses. This one is a strong one. If you're familiar with this, this is uh, Ostracyper scabra. Um, part of both TECs, it'll be more common in the grey box. 
Um, it's got these beautiful golden heads that blow in the winds, and you can get patches of it like this, and it makes it easily identifiable. It does look like some weedy grasses, but if you get familiar with it quickly enough, you should be able to pick it. Um, it's a very common and easy one that when we learn plants out in, in this part of the world on the Western Slopes, it's one we learn very quickly. Um, it's just a golden seed head set and the sort of raspy um, stems at the bottom that um, make it easily identifiable. It's a good grass to have in large patches. Um, you might see this, a bulbiny lily. Uh, my garden again, but they can look like this out in the bush if you get the right patch. These beautiful star-shaped yellow flowers. It's related to leeks and onions and uh, plants in that group. Um, they can flower for most of the year. Sometimes they like a moist spot. We did see them at the Mount Arthur picnic area at Wellington. It might have been a different species, but the flowers look pretty much the same. Beautiful yellow, uh, easy to identify. I can't think of any weeds that you'll get that all sort of look like that. Um, great plant to have, um, and it's part of uh, both of the TECs. It's it's one of the sort of showy species. Likes a bit of moisture. Danielle sent me these ones, and we did see this last week. Um, this is Stackhousia monogyna. It's called creepy candle, creamy candles. This is a beautiful plant, and we did see these at Mount Arthur. They've got five petaled flowers, come up in a real showy spike like this. And if these are hanging around in the ground layer on your property or your, your favourite bushland patch, it shows that the ground layer is in, in not too bad a condition if these sort of things are hanging in there. Um, they can they, You can just get sort of colonies of them through the ground layer, and they're, they're quite beautiful. Just two more to go. This is, uh, well, this is a plant I'm familiar with, but I, I won't go into that. This is called a Juga australis. We saw a lot of this in Mount Wellington and it piqued a lot of interest. It's it's actually related to all those culinary herbs like mint and oregano and lavender, but the leaves don't really smell in, in this particular native one. But it's a nice plant. It's got nice purple flowers. It'll sort of grow stems to 30 centimetres tall. It doesn't show up everywhere, but it shows up in a few patches. And again, if you've got this in your ground layer, it, it sort of shows that, that the ground layer would, would sort of be moderately intact or, or mostly intact. Um, it's a very interesting Australian species. It, it looks very different from place to place and they'll, they'll probably break it up into multiple species sooner or later. But it's part of both um, TECs. It, this thing grows right across New South Wales um, quite commonly. And uh, we snapped an orchid just at the end. Um, this is Caledonia tentaculata. This was generating a lot of interest last week. It's a real funky orchid. Um, gets called fringe spider orchid. Um, and there's a few Caledonias with this sort of shape. But um, Beck just got this last week. If you have orchids in your ground layer, Again, it shows that the, the ground layer is pretty in pretty good nick or, or the all the essentials are there for orchids to be able to grow. It's hard to find orchids a lot of the time in degraded landscapes. So if these are hanging in there um, and they are listed as, as both um, part in both TECs, I've seen this in grassy box woodland around Bathurst. Um, beautiful plant. And so if, if you're getting orchids in your patch, that's really good evidence that there's a lot of resilience there. And I'd be documenting them as best you can, documenting what, what orchids that you're getting, because there is a few rare ones out there. And it just demonstrates uh, the good nature of that ground layer. So don't forget that handout. I've just thrown it in there at the end. That's the local land services handout that's also on the website. And I'm more than happy to hang around and answer any questions for as long as you want until Beck or Danielle um, shut the door on us. Yeah. That was, that was excellent. Thank you so much, Dan. Fantastic.